quick introduction. So I'm based here in Oxford and I help run an organization called Rios. Uh, over the last 15 years or so, so just from before I met Dwayne, I've been working on challenges that we would call complex. So things from things like public health care, climate change, um, uh, in some cases uh, state collapse, but, but essentially issues that we would classify as, as complex. And, um, and as Dwayne said, I've written a book and the book essentially is a summary of uh, what I've learned over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is essentially, I'm going to talk briefly, it's going to be a summary of the book. And um, when I um, first got into the, the idea of writing a book, I uh, was very quickly, uh, all my ideas about books were dispelled. So my motivation writing the book was to not have to repeat myself <laughs> again and again and again. And uh, um, the first conversation I had with my publisher, he said to me, he said, you know, before we get into this, uh, you know that nobody's going to read your book, right? <laughs> I was like, what? What are you talking about? Why are we publishing a book? And he said, come on, you know this. Nobody reads these days. And I said, well, why are we publishing a book? And he said, well, uh, don't get me wrong. People want the book. They just don't want to read the book. Um, so, so this is probably the 25th talk I've given since the book's been published about a month and a half ago. Uh, so uh, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and keep this short. And um, Dwayne has copies of the book, I think, for you um, yep. outside, right? Yep. OK. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk in threes, basically. So I have three things I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the news, the bad news, and the good news. Um, the news I hope all of you have heard is that our societies are getting more complex. They are more complex. And that shouldn't be, um, uh, there shouldn't be a headline for anybody. So we hear this word um, complex all the time. And um, we <coughs> hear this word being used to describe the systems we work in, our organizations, our societies. And uh, what does it mean? Uh, so the, the way I understand complexity is that there are three broad characteristics about uh, which, which tell us why things are complex, uh, why societies are complex. And the first is that things are emergent. So we're constantly seeing new things emerge that we cannot predict. So the trajectory, if you like, of society is unpredictable. So if I had a, a pigeon in my hand and I threw the pigeon across the room, we wouldn't really be able to tell where that pigeon is going to land. So the path the pigeon takes, if you like, or the bird takes is unpredictable. Uh, it's emergent. So that's one characteristic. Things are emergent. Uh, the second thing is that um, as a result of that emergence, we tend to generate massive amounts of information about the societies that we're a part of. So, you know, put a GPS on the bird and throw it, throw it across the room, and you tend to get more and more information. Um, that I, think, I think the chief scientist at IBM said the amount of information in the world is doubling every two years. Now, what that means is that anytime you try and address a situation that's complex, there's always something you don't know, right? There's always a new report or a new assessment or a new analysis that's been published, which essentially means that um, you very clearly can't know everything about a situation. So you've got to act in a situation where there's more and more and more information. And the feeling we get from that is that we don't know enough. We have to do more analysis. We have to do more mapping in order to actually proceed. Uh, so that's, that's the second characteristic. And the third is that as a result of um, that information, and as a result of uh, the emergence that we're seeing, people tend to adapt and change their behavior uh, autonomously. So people are changing their behavior, you've got new information, and you've got situations that are emergent. Um, and what that means is that very few things in society are stable. Everything, almost everything is a variable. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to design responses or come up with responses to situations that are broadly cha fast changing and variable. Um, so we get this feeling that just things are moving faster and faster. And that's the context of the work that all of us are basically doing. Um, so if you're trying to deal with climate change or you know, public health care issues or you know, deforestation or um, you know, political issues, what you get is essentially change. Uh, and you're designing for change. So that's, that's, that's the news, right? Everyone's heard of that? No, no surprises there, right? I hope. OK. so. What's, there's, there's the bad news. Okay, so the bad news is that um, we have a dominant response to that situation, <clears throat> the situation of complexity. The dominant response is essentially planning. So uh, planning is an early 20th century response. And essentially what planning is, is it's, it's, it's coming up with a, a, a logical, strategic, strategic in quotes, um, plan that you can fit on paper. Right? Uh, and, and planning, uh, the bad news is planning doesn't work in complexity. And the, the case I kind of make in my book and the argument I'm going to make is that planning essentially has a 90 to 100% failure rate <clears throat> in all situations. So this is not, um, 
you know, only in complex situations. So in the best of situations, planning has a 90% failure rate. And for an organization, what that means is it's essentially, is it on time, is it on budget, is it on scope, right? So 90% failure rate in that sense. And then the failure rate goes up when you start talking about systems. So if you start talking about um, conservation or species loss, well, you know, we have organizations that have been working, uh, I'm sure some of you are part of them, for 50 years on, on, on conservation and species loss. And what we're seeing is um, dramatic acceleration of species loss. So at a systemic level, what we're seeing is essentially uh, the failure of these wider systems. So there's a couple of reasons why planning fails. But one of the main reasons why planning fails is it's predictive. <coughs> so you try and write something that predicts the future. So you say, OK, in year one, we're going to spend these resources. We're going to produce these outputs. In year two, we're going to do this. Year three, we're going to do this, and so on. So it's, it's predictive. And you're operating in an environment where prediction doesn't really work very well. Um, so th there are some basic reasons why planning doesn't work. Um, and unfortunately, most of our resources and talent go into planning-based responses. So obviously, you have responses that are not planning-based. But they're a minority culture. So you've got this majority culture, this dominant culture, if you like, of planning, where you know, trillions of dollars, trillions of pounds a year go into planning-based responses. They largely fail. And then we've got this minority culture that's basically saying we should do things differently. Now, the reason um, <clears throat> that's bad news is that uh, what we're seeing around us is, if you like, um, the dominance of an idea that is essentially a, a, what I call a zombie idea. So planning as an idea is dead, basically. Okay? It's, it's been around for over 100 years. It broadly doesn't work. And so what we've got is we've got a zombie apocalypse. We've got the collapse of systems around us. So systems primarily that are reliant on natural resources and a natural resource base that are basically declining and collapsing because of the dominance of this zombie idea. So we've got this zombie apocalypse, right? And um, in that zombie apocalypse, um, we are designing campaigns. Uh, and we are, we are coming up with um, responses to that, to that challenge. Uh, so that's the bad news. Um, the good news is that we have a different response. We know, we know what a different response looks like, what a more effective response looks like. So, and as Duane kind of alluded, um, the different response is essentially experimentation. So if you imagine um, a cancer researcher, so no donor would go to a cancer researcher and say, uh, I'd like you to come up with a five-year plan, tell me what inputs you're going to use and what outputs you're going to produce, and you've got five years to come up with a cure for cancer. And if you don't do that, your funding is going to be at risk. So it's a ludicrous idea, right? Or imagine um, going to a startup, going to Google in its first year and saying to, saying to the founders of Google, uh, yep, we're happy to give you funding, but we need a five-year plan. We need a log frame, and we need to tell us what inputs you're going to use and what outputs you're going to produce every year for the next five years, every quarter per year, right? It's just a ludicrous idea that you would ask uh, an entity like that to do that. But that happens in, in this domain a lot, where donors and funders basically want that kind of information. They want a plan, basically, right? Now, in, 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 um, in a lab-based space or an experimental-based space, you're not investing in uh, a plan. You're investing in a team. So if you want to come up with a cure for cancer, the plan is irrelevant. The talent is what matters. So if you can bring together people that have talent, then you've got a hope. Then you can basically say, OK, if you've got these people together, then, then I'm going to provide some resources and some funding. And that is actually true for many, many different fields. So you know, um, the startup field, entrepreneurship, res basic research, medicine, science, engineering. We understand this idea that we have to invest in teams that will undertake processes over time. And they will produce things that are valuable, but it's very difficult to predict what those things are. Right? And there may be a breakthrough in five years, or in 10 years, or in 15 years. But if we want solutions to these really complex challenges, we have to keep investing in the teams. Um, and what I find, particularly in the development space, <coughs> teams, are the, teams are in the appendix. It's like appendix three, got a, little, a couple of bios at the back, basically. Right? Don't, don't have them too long, because we don't want to take too much space. Right? So the bulk, of, the bulk of time, energy, and attention goes to the plan. And then a minor amount goes to the team. <coughs> so um, <coughs> the work we've been doing over the last 10 or 15 years has been essentially trying to come up with um, a response that is more effective than a planning-based response, right? So if the argument is that a planning-based response has a 0 to 10% chance of succeeding, then how, how do we increase the odds? How do we increase the probabilities that um, a response is more effective than that? So that's, a pretty, that's pretty ineffective, 0 to 10%. And um, <clears throat> so 
if you are a venture capitalist or an investor, typically uh, a 20 to 30 percent success rate is good, right? Now, <clears throat> that's the kind of success rate we're looking for with, with these complex challenges. So if we can up our success rates from 10 percent to 20 or 30 percent, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, and particularly when you're talking about these very large complex uh, challenges. So how do we do that? So there are three broad characteristics of, of a, a response that can be built into pretty much um, anything. Uh, and <clears throat> in, in, in the book I talk about labs, but essentially what we're talking about is experimentation. But the, the three characteristics, if you like, are, the first is the response has to be social. So I use the word social. What do I mean by social? What I mean is that the people that are profoundly impacted, that are really impacted by the situation, have to be part of coming up with a response, have to be part of designing a response, right? Um, and that's extremely difficult to do. So uh, a planning-based response, in contrast, brings together a very small group of technocrats that will design a solution and then figure out how to implement that, typically downwards. So it's essentially, planning is a neo-Soviet response, right? Moscow rules, right? Um, so with, with, um, uh, with a more experimental response or a more effective response, you'd essentially need the socials be part of designing um, your response. So that's one thing. The second is the approach you take has to be experimental. And what I mean by that is it's basically, it's basically trial and error. You've got to try something out, you've got to see what works, and then you've got to ramp up your investment based on what you think works, uh, based on the evidence that you're getting back. So not necessarily what you think works, but the evidence you get back. So you've got to have a portfolio. You've got to have a spread of responses that you can try out. And, and not put essentially all your eggs in one basket, which is what a planning-based response would do, right? So that's the second characteristic. Um, and the third characteristic is that the response has to be systemic in its attitude. So in terms of how you, uh, how you think about complexity and complex challenges, what we're trying to do is we're trying to address situations at, at, the, at the level of cause. Right? So what's causing climate change? What's causing hunger? What's causing, um, what's causing the arms trade? Right? So how do we basically change the causal nature and the determinants of those situations? And, and there is no formula for doing that. It's essentially an attitude. It's a, it's a way of thinking about a particular problem, right? which is what's causing it, how do we change those things? And if, you, if, if we basically build those three characteristics into all of our responses, social, experimental, and systemic, the probabilities of success will essentially go up. The interesting thing about um, planning-based responses and sort of this idea of a neo-Soviet <coughs> approach is that um, they're not sector it's not sectorally bound. It's not that the public sector is sort of particularly slow and neo-Soviet and the private sector is not. It's common across sectors. Organizations and institutions are typically command and control. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a leadership team that essentially makes broad decisions and then Dictats flow down, you know, from the leadership team. And so our institutions are essentially a challenge as well because they have this neo-Soviet character more or less, depending on who, on who you are. Um, and I think that's changing as well. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure people have heard of the lean movement. Um, so, you know, lean, agile, all of these approaches are essentially saying there's a different and a better way of, of addressing these challenges. And, um, and so, you know, we work with a lot of organizations that are struggling to figure out how to respond fast enough to the complexity that they're seeing. Um, so there is a broad, I think, movement in general around um, organizations changing to essentially be much leaner, much more agile, to be able to essentially operate on much shorter feedback loops. And I think the good news for all of you as campaigners is that um, the campaign and essentially digital media is essentially the feedback loop that's missing, right? So there's a, there's a feedback loop which is you need information from the systems that you're working on in order to be able to change and respond to them, well, where does that information come from? Right? How do you get access to that information? So in a purely market-based response, the information comes from the market. Right? But we don't have that with social problems and social challenges. How do you know something's working? How do you, how do you, where do you get the data from that tells you and the information from that tells you people want this or don't want this? So there's a, there's a critical role I think that campaigns and campaigning in particular has to play in, uh, in essentially allowing uh, organizations to be able to move and respond for as quickly as they need to in these contexts. The funding piece. Um, so one of, one of the things I see kind of in the social sphere, if you like, is um, this push for metrics and, you know, measurements. And if we can demonstrate that we have results, then, you know, we can access more money and, you know, and, do and accountability, right? So in the public domain, there's an accountability movement, payment by results and so on. And um, 
if you just for one minute take this idea that 90% of plans fail, and I'm going to come to the source in a second, um, the fact is we're funding things that broadly fail, right? So rationally, we shouldn't be funding them. If you look at the data sets that are, that are underlying them, the, the evidence is, there's very little evidence that what we're doing works, actually, if you think about strategic planning. So the decisions around funding are not made on a rational basis, <laughs> despite what we think. Um, so on what basis are they made, is the question. So why are people basically funding certain things and not funding other things? And largely, it's, a, it's, a cu it's culture. There's a dominant culture of what it's acceptable to fund, well, it's not acceptable fun. What is kind of edgy and innovative and a bit like, well, we'll put a little bit of money into that, but, you know, the bulk of our resources are going to go into this. So, you know, kind of more at the macro level, there's an issue of culture and there's an issue of culture change and how we shift the culture of funding and so on. And uh, the good news, in a sense, is that, um, you know, governments and institutions fund experimentation research all the time. I mean, you know, <coughs> massive amounts of money go into research, right, and go into funding laboratories in the technical space, in medical, you know, in all sorts of spaces. So I think there's a culture shift that's needed. And I also think that um, donors need to be pushed and challenged as to what they think is uh, effective. You know, and obviously there's a short-term issue, which is that, you know, donors will put donor conditionalities on what money they want to give you and essentially force you down a funnel that, you know, doesn't make a huge amount of sense. And I think the only way out of that is, is broad shifts in culture where donors come to realize. And, and let me give you an analogy. It's a little bit like, um, you know, somebody basically saying, I'm going to hire you to, win, to help me win the lottery, right? Okay, so the odds of winning the lottery in the UK are 14 million to one. Now, if I hire you and basically say, uh, I want you to help me win the lottery, but I want the odds to be 50%. It's, it's a bit like, what are you talking about? The odds are 14 million to one. It's like, no, no, no. I don't like those odds. I want the odds to be 50%. I want a 50% success rate. Now, you've got two options. One is to say I'm crazy, basically say, look, you're completely bonkers. That's not going to work. It doesn't work that way. Or you basically make it up, right? You basically come up with a series of activities and you sort of interpret those and say, yeah, we, we're, kind of, we're kind of at 50%, right? right? And that's typically what happens in, in a, in a neo-Soviet system. You have to game the system, basically, unfortunately, right? And this happens all the time where your donors are basically asking for something that makes no sense, right? And, you know, one of the things I, 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 um, I've been doing over the last year is going to organizations and saying, what's an acceptable failure rate? You know, and that's, the answers to that are really interesting. And in this space, you know, typically people say 50% or, you know, or 30, 70%, right? It's a bit like, wow, 50% success is very high. So I think there's a challenge there just in the, in the culture. That's a quick response to your question. I know it doesn't help you necessarily in the short term, but um, so 90%. Uh, so I'm just going to, I just want to be clear. So I'm talking about strategic planning. I'm not talking about action planning. Okay. So strategic planning essentially as a formal, producing a, a formal document that essentially predicts five years down the line, three years down the line, what is going to happen, um, has a 90% failure rate. The literature on this is extensive and old. So there's a guy at um, McGill University called Henry Mitzberg, who's a, been a professor for a long time, who wrote a book, I think 20 years ago, called The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning, where he basically studies um, planning, does what good academics do, looks at the evidence base, and concludes that 90% of plans fail. So there's an extensive literature around planning failure. Um, and what, what I've noticed in the literature is that people tend to then start using a different word for planning and basically saying, well, we're doing it wrong, right? We've got to do it differently. If only we did it differently, it would work, which I don't think is true. So that's the source. Then just to come to your um, question about where it is appropriate for. So planning works in situations that are technical in nature. So if you have a clear problem definition and a clear solution definition, then you can essentially use planning. Uh, and so an example would be putting a man on the moon, right? So the, the problem definition is pretty clear. You've got to build, you know, you've got to essentially figure out how to get someone off the planet, you've got to keep them alive, so on. There's no real dispute about the problem definition, and there's no real dispute about the solution definition. You need to build a propulsion system, you need to you know, do all these things. When, when you're in a situation where those two things are clear, you can hand it over to an expert, a set of experts and say, solve this problem. And the reason you can do that is because the, the variables don't really change. So gravity doesn't change while you're trying to figure out how to put a man on the moon, right? Now, if you're working in mental health, that's a whole different story. So the very nature of mental health, for example, as a challenge, is changing over time. So what constitutes a mental health problem today is not what constituted a mental health problem 20 years ago. It's changed, and it's going to change again. So where you have stable situations where um, you've got constants and you've got clear problem definitions, clear solution definitions, you can use planning.
very so so complex systems as a su have as a subset will have technical problems and what we tend to do what our donors tend to do is want solutions to predictable situations and predictable problems technical problems basically which is why we have a plethora of apps and technical solutions to social challenges so psychological challenge so one of the things I always thought when, uh, over the last 10 years when I've worked on challenges that are really complex is that when things get really bad, people will basically say, well, clearly we've got to do something different now, right? Because, you know, things are devolving so rapidly, you know, people are dying, it's just terrible, we must do something innovative and different. That hasn't proven to be the case. So what tends to happen in a situation of crisis is actually the opposite. So when you, just to give you an analogy, when you join the army, um, the way you're trained in boot camp is through repetition, right? So you're basically asked to do the same task again and again and again to build muscle memory, right? So you're, the idea there is that when you're in a, in a conflict or when you're in a crisis, your head will disassociate and your muscles need to remember what to do in that situation. What you're doing is in a crisis, your head is disassociated because it's in fight or flight, so your muscles need to remember what to do. Now, planning is muscle memory. It's what we're trained how to do, right? So what I've found that when situations become worse and worse and worse, we tend to fall back on muscle memory. So instead of going, wow, this situation requires innovation because you know, what we're trying isn't working, we tend to fall back on what we know how to do. So and, and, and in, in, a, in a complex situation, that's typically institutional context, it's typically planning. So the challenge is even more profound. What you're actually doing is you're trying to break muscle memory. Um, and the thing that actually breaks muscle memory is events, right? So if you imagine the Arab Spring or the financial crisis, institutions that have been doing things the way they've been doing them for so long are forced to change their behavior. They have no choice. They're basically confronted by an event and they're basically told, they basically risk looking like idiots or changing their behavior, essentially, right? So in some ways, what a lot of you are trying to do is create events. And those events rupture muscle memory. They create, a, a, they create a situation that people are forced to respond to, where they have no choice but to say, well, we've got to, we've got to acknowledge that you know, there's an advert on TV uh, where when someone eats a Kit Kat, there's blood flowing out from it. Oh, we can't ignore that, right? So that's what, that's what I feel is needed. You need, you need to create events, basically, um, that essentially cannot be ignored, right? And that's a big part of, um, a big part of what we're doing. Ego uh, of your superiors, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I'm sure all of you have ideas how to do that. But um, yeah, I, I, yeah. So I think, that, I think that's just part of life, right? You've got to figure out how to deal with that. And, and I think, you know, um, there's lots and lots of evidence out there if you're trying to make a rational case for these sort of things working. So look for the evidence, I would say, and make the case. Thank you.